time to do the full narrative breakdown of a video game story mainly because I've been viewing and reviewing more recent titles which will be bad form to give away spoilers for them so this time though I'm reviewing something that's about a few years old so it's something that I can really sink my teeth into and really get into discussions about the game story that game is Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 before I get into the story, there's something I need to make clear. This game's controls are, frankly, perfect. This is one of the best controlling shooters of all time, particularly on consoles. Game developers could learn a lot about how this game controls. So, before I start criticizing the game's narrative, I do want to give credit where credit is due. Infinity War should be congratulated for designing a game that controls this well. Similarly, this game's multiplayer is some of the best out there today. And I would consider it one of the four pillars of video game multiplayer in terms of shooters. But that's a topic for another episode. The action is fast-paced and intense and balanced. There is no god gun. Yes, you do get die easily and quickly when you're shot. But everybody dies quickly when they're shot and with any gun. So it really comes down to who is the better player. It comes down to skill. Additionally, through the use of death perks and... Um, using what are called different types of kill streaks, you, both offensive kill streaks, which reset when you're killed, and support kill streaks, which keep building even after you die. This allows for balance for people with different play styles and different skill levels, so everyone can have fun in the game, and everyone can feel like they're contributing to their team's success in multiplayer. Honestly, this is the best multiplayer the Call of Duty series has had ever if you are into the multiplayer and that's what you're looking for this game is a definite buy now multiplayer isn't everything and while good gameplay is excellent for a title it can do wonders for making up for other aspects of it a good solid gameplay experience can make up for graphics which are perhaps lackluster or various other things when it comes to this single player narrative and single player mode well it's subject to criticism too if you put your single player in there if you have a single player campaign campaign in there i get to criticize it yes the multiplayer is great but let's talk about the single player before i do that though i need to give a pre brief little rundown of well the first two games modern warfare one followed two main plots the first was a SAS unit led by Captain Price, who was basically the reincarnation of the main character from Modern War, from Modern Warfare, but Call of Duty one through three, and a group of U.S. soldiers in a fictitious Middle Eastern country, which I'm going to refer to as Karak. The SAS unit was involved hunting down a. Well, Russian ultra-nationalist um, named Imran Zakev, I'm pretty sure I pronounced that right, who basically wanted to take Russia back to the halcyon days of the Soviet Union under Stalin. Where, um, with the U.S. plotline, again, it, it's set in not Iraq, with a new group of U.S. soldiers sent into the country to find out, well, to find anything out, but just to do stop a, well, totalitarian regime from taking over the country and solidifying their hold and restore, putting things back into the hands of the people. Which is a little iffy from a geopolitical standpoint. And actually, that's, that's the game's main narrative problem. Um, however, this becomes less of an issue when the U.S. force is nuked by a bomb supplied by the ultranationalists, because this is basically a big old thing to distra um, distract the NATO powers and the West from Zakayev's plans in Russia. Eventually, after this, they figure everything out. They send the troops to a special operations team 
to Russia to stop Sakaev, and they managed to prevent him from having global thermonuclear Armageddon. Um, his reason isn't clearly given, but the most logical explanation that I can think of is that if the Russian government is nuked in response to his missile launch, it'll be easier for him to him and his forces to take control of the country, and he doesn't really care too much about the civilians killed in the nuclear holocaust because, well, he's evil. The story was actually kind of grounded moderately well in reality. Yes, the Russian ultranationalists probably wouldn't actually be able to muster this much of a fo support force in the Russian government, in particular the Russian military, but it kind of worked. You had to suspend your disbelief, as you have to do with most stories, but you didn't have to suspend your disbelief to levels which broke the experience or insulted your intelligence. Further, the spectacle was kept to reasonable levels, and when something big happened, like when the nuke went off, it felt special, and it didn't break the tone of the story. Things felt personal and somewhat relatable. With Modern Warfare 2, on the other hand, the narrative started to go off the rails. Despite the fact that Sakaev basically tried to kill massive numbers of the Russian populace, somehow the nationalists managed to take control of Russia every way, and anyway, and made Zakaev into a national hero. Statues in the former Red Square, naming Moscow's biggest airport after the man who wanted to wipe out, to cause Moscow to be wiped out and cleansing nuclear fire. Yeah, that sort of thing. Um, however, this wasn't quite enough for Zakaev's number two, Vladimir Makarov, which, I'm not going to say it's the most cliched Russian name ever. The most cliched Russian name would be Ivan Klashnikov or something like that. But, yeah, it's a little iffy. And he wanted revenge against the NATO forces, which took down Makarov. Thus, we get um, him working with a U.S. general, uh, Lieutenant General Shepard, no first name given. Shepard basically is upset that the U.S. populace wasn't mad enough after their forces were killed by a new, wiped out by, not totally wiped out, but horribly, well, they took horrible losses, and his men took horrible losses in the nuclear attack in the first game. Basically, he wanted us to go to, once the Nauta Nationalists go, went, took over, he wanted us to go to war with Russia. And so, ultimately, uh, Makarov and Shepard joined forces to get this war. Uh, Shepard um, sent a undercover agent into Makarov's tr group, who then launched an attack on the Russian airport. This is the infamous "no Russian" level from the from the second game. In which, as part of this, Makarov knew this agent was there, killed this agent, basically to set up a war between the United States and Russia, because one dead American guy was apparently among the terrorists. This is, this is where things might not go nuts, because this is the kind of thing where this is what, you know, Secretary of State does for a living, is for smoothing out things like this. Like, oh, we were sending us, like, either Shepard comes, um, says, oh, this is an agent I sent in to infiltrate Makarov's organization, he wasn't able to stop this attack because he was trying to get Makarov himself, or something like that. Um, or any other number of things. But somehow, this gets, this persuades all of NATO that the U.S. is bad, thus when the Russians invade the United States in the game, they, well, they succeed. They successfully land massive numbers of troops on U.S. shores. They did do a decent job earlier on in the game of establishing how the Russians managed to get past U.S. satellite security and various other little things. But there is a certain view of the issue of any Russian invasion of the U.S. would have to cross the Atlantic, which would require them to go past every NATO nation, which would in turn mean that if that when NATO would theoretically get involved, because under the NATO treaty they would prior to, that their, that their forces supply lines would basically be ripped to shreds. But, yeah, this is where, man, this is where logic leaves the picture for this series. Um, 
I mean, Russians invade the U.S. thanks to the efforts of Captain Price, who was believed to have been killed at the end of the last game. Turns out to be simply held prisoner in a Russian gulag. They are thwarted. Price and Soap kill Shepard, but are unable to reveal the results of their investigation and the truth of his plan to the world, and are thus forced to go on the run. <sighs> Ultimately, my main, the the main problem with this plan, as far as in, is the narrative is concerned. It feels like something a 9-11 truth here would come up with. It's the kind of thing where U.S. government troops, US, members of the U.S. government, fake a terrorist incident or a military attack. Again, bare example, forget, forget the U.S., but, but members of a government fake a terrorist attack against their own populace, causing massive loss of death, loss of life, to frame a foreign power to lead into a massive bloody war for an unclear purpose. That is basically, if you take the any names of nations out of the picture, you don't mention the U.S., don't mention Russia, don't mention Afghanistan, that's kind of the thesis of the 9-11 truthers in terms of what their, of what the gist of what they're trying to say is. Once you go beyond the gist to details about how the attacks were carried out, and the forensic evidence of the attacks, it then becomes explicitly clear that in the case of 9-11 truthers, they are completely off their freaking rockers. Which leads me to the problem with this game, or other Modern Warfare 2, where it basically feels like a plot the truthers came up with, and it thus leads to certain levels of unfortunate implications of these undertones. Again, I could get more in depth about that game's plot, but that's not what I'm here to talk about today. I'm here to talk about Modern Warfare 3, and now that I've laid the groundwork for Modern Warfare 3's story, let's talk about Modern Warfare 3, where the narrative basically conceits and justifications are given even less consideration. The game starts immediately after the conclusion of Modern Warfare 2, with the battle so if you're the back to the same problem in Pakistan and India. Oh, so meanwhile, in the U.S., the Delta Force has been strikes to allow U.S. air and sea forces to push the Russian on their last drop to the As so the stabilized Christ and his Russian loyalist contact Here again is where things start going off the rails right off the bat. For Makarov's attack on Soap and Price in India to work, they would have to move Russian troops through both, well, either or both, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Let's think about this for a second. Russia, back into the Soviet Union, invaded Afghanistan towards the end of the Soviet Union's life. The response to this could be summarized as poor. If you've seen, oh, I don't know, um, how about Rambo 3, or, oh, how about License not as licensed to kill, Living Daylights, or if you want to get something more realistic and more based in reality, um, Charlie Wilson's Roar, either the book, either read the book or watch the movie. The movie plays fast and loose again, but just kind of go right, right to those. You'll know that the Afghanis rebelled with the, with the assist, with some military assistance from the CIA in terms of supplying arms and equipment and some training on how to use these arms, they were able to overcome the Russians, and thus gain their independence. But, keep on, this is a part of the world where grudges persist. So, as you can imagine, if the Russian, oh, hey, say the head of the Russian intelligence service were to contact the head of the Afghani intelligence service and say, 
oh, we are sending military helicopters through here. Please don't shoot them down. The head of the Afghan intelligence service would probably say, go fuck yourself, we're going to shoot them down. Particularly considering that the head of the Russian government, uh, the Russian government is heading in the kind of directions that Russia was in when it was Soviet and when it was invading Afghanistan the last time. I mean, it's a covert ops mission. If we shoot them down, you're denying that these guys exist, so it's not a cause for a war. And we get to, you know, kill some, Rus kill some Russian military forces. Win-win. Pakistan, same general thing. They were providing assistance to Afghanistan under the table. They were letting Afghani forces move their equipment through Pakistan with little fear of reprisal because... They didn't like having the Russians on their border any more than the Afghanis liked having the Russians inside their borders. So, there's that. And if the Russians sent their helicopters through and all that, you know, without asking permission from the Pakistani or Afghani governments, the response would definitely be, oh, we're going to shoot them down because there are these mysterious helicopters coming through our airspace. We should probably do something about that with rockets and bullets. Saying. Two months later, the president of the Russian Federation is preparing for peace negotiations with the United States when Makarov forces attack his plane and down it. Makarov uh, captures the president and demands the nuclear launch codes so we can use them to take over the world! Of course! I always wanted to use that clip. Meanwhile, Price and company attempt to find out what Makarov is up to, and they trace his plan to an arms dealer in Sierra Leone, but arrives too late to catch his cargo. So they tip off the SAS, but are unable to stop the ultimate objective of his plan, to launch a series of massive biological weapons attacks throughout Europe, each designed to basically throw the governments and military forces of all the NATO member nations into chaos, opening up Europe for a massive invasion by the Russian military all the way through Eastern Europe into Germany and France. Alright, <clears throat> I call bullshit. Bullshit and shenanigans. Within the game's own timeline, it has been two months since the Russians, well, they withdrew from the United States with their tail tucked between their legs. They lost the war. They lost the lives of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of their troops, and not to mention millions, if not billions of dollars of equipment. And they withdrew. Even if of those losses, of those people who were, of those soldiers who were, and casualties of war, assuming that not 100% of them were KIAs. Let's say that, oh, rough estimate, let's say uh, 500,000 troops were casualties, and of those, we'll have 400 of them be wounded. Where these people are going to have psychological distress through, um, well, post-traumatic stress disorder, because, yo, they were in firefights. They were getting shot at. They were getting nearly killed. Their friends were getting killed or, you know, wounded around them in a place that is way, way far from home. Thousands of miles, millions of miles from home. I'm not going to go look up the precise geographical stuff, distance here, but far from home, potentially dying without ever seeing their family, friends, or loved ones again. Yeah, these people are traumatized, so it'll be difficult. So putting them in, you know, a military situation, within combat situation, within two months of their instant, of their injury, not good. Some of these people may even require more rehabilitation than that. Let's put aside people who are were wounded, survived, but will likely never be able to serve again. People who've lost the use of limbs, people who've been paralyzed, that sort of thing. The people still need time to, recu to recuperate and heal from their injuries, whether they're burns or gunshot wounds or whatever. I can't see two months or less being enough to get to basically get the Russian military back on its feet enough to invade Europe. 
Not just like, you know, oh, we're going to launch a strike force against Britain. No, we're going to launch a strike force against the, the like, Ukraine and Finland and various countries that share immediate direct borders with Russia and limit ourselves to, lo to those. No, all of Europe. Further, military failure at this level tends to lead to major changes and shifts in government. With the Vietnam War, there was, well, a massive shift in terms of, of power between the Republican Party, who was pushing the war, and basically in, in favor of other, other politicians, Democrats, and so forth, who wanted to end the war, who were running on platforms of ending the Vietnam War. Basically, a whole generation of politicians made into office basically on the promise of, I will get us out of Vietnam. And that's in the U.S., which is democracy. When you have a pseudo-Stalinist government come to power, then things get even worse, because now you're going to be having active protests in the streets and the distinct possibility of, you know, possibly a more liberal, more peace-liking um person coming to power, either by your Politburo saying, ooh, we have a problem here, let's shift things up and put someone to negotiate a peace in charge, so we don't have an uprising on our hands, or other things, because, you know, a short, victorious war, when you just had a mess, a short failure war, a, a short defeat at in war, not going to work, not going to pacify the people. Why, to the contrary, it will make them matter. Among other things, the aside from the growing support for democracy and capitalism in Eastern Europe, as um, East Berlin and Czechoslovakia and all of them basically left the Warsaw Pact and left under and left the USSR to seek out their own destiny. So a similar sort, so similar things were going on in Russia. Many of some of these were fueled by the defeat in Afghanistan, which I mentioned earlier. So, in fact, the game kind of gets into this briefly by having the Russian pre the Russian president, who it's not stated whether he's new or not, but it's a reasonable assumption that in fact he is a new Russian president and he is searching for peace with the United States. He's trying to get peace. In fact, he's going to, to a peace conference. And it's not like Makarov engineers things to say, oh, the president is dead. He's been killed by horrible Western agents. Um, clearly, they are seeking to press the war against our own people. We must counterattack. He's not doing anything like that. It's, in fact, from the little news headlines we see in the game, the pre Russian president is missing. He has not been confirmed dead. Um, nor is a prime minister or vice president of Russia who would be sympathetic to Makarov's cause be described as being running things in the um, more dovish president's absence. Um, additionally, they have the Russian military basically able to roll over all of Eastern Europe, most of Germany, and is ba they're basically stopped at France very rapidly after the gas attack. Indeed, there's a bit of dialogue in a cutscene where, um, around the time of the gas attacks, from Ramstein Air Force Base, which is in central Germany, basically near the East German-West German border, or back in the day, because of the Cold War, when it was built, and there's a bit of dialogue where they're talking about the attack, where the people call it saying, hey, we're under attack! And somebody said, yep, we're sending decontamination units to you now. Um, break out gas equipment. We'll have somebody there to help contain that. Uh, people there to help contain this. No, no, no. It's the Russians. They're attacking. They're soldiers. Russian army. They're attacking. Like, between Russia and Germany, there's a bunch of countries. You know, Ukraine, Poland. Um, the Czech, Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia, yeah, Czech Republic and Slovakia. There's, um, oh God, there's Croatia, there's Bosnia, um, Austria. There, I'm f forgetting countries here. Um, there's just all sorts of, there's a lot of countries there, all with their own militaries. 
And even if they're just like not stopping to fight anybody, it'll probably take them a day or two to get there. At which point, people with satellites will probably be watching Europe, and certainly the people in the U.S. who are getting paid to watch Russian troop movements after, you know, they just invaded the United States, not to make sure they're not, you know, planning anything else, like missile attacks, um, would see Russian troops rolling outside of their borders in large numbers, enough to, say, conquer several countries, if not perhaps all of Europe, and send warnings. Rammstein Air Base should be on insanely high alert because they should already know these Russian troop movements are coming before the gas attack. Similarly, if they're doing this all, if they're start initiating the attack to coincide with the gas attacks, then, well, in which case, the attack, the gas attack should be starting in Poland and the Ukraine and all of Eastern Europe and then moving their way west to coincide with the locations of Russian troops. At which point, well, Germany, Britain, France have advanced warning. You know, these they, they have the attacks are coming by at least a day or so, because the because the gas attacks have to coincide with the military attacks in order for them to be most effective. Unless, of course, the well, the writers are basically going to have some nasty stereotypes about the state of the militaries of, you know, Eastern Europe. That they're capable of fighting anybody. Basically taking the idea that, oh, World War II, the Polish military is sending cavalry against the uh, Germans. That's the best they can offer. But the thing is, no, they were able to stage a serious defense against the Russians and hold them up for a, the Nazis during World War II and hold them up for a month. Can you imagine with modern technology what they could do? Yeah, maybe not a maybe they couldn't hold them up for an entire month and hold up the German advance for the Russian advance for that long. But you know, maybe a few weeks. Slow them up. Probably since some of these Eastern European countries are members of NATO, so that Germany and France and all of them could move troops up. In fact, you know what? Yeah, uh, there probably aren't as many dramatic you know, freaking landmarks like the Eiffel Tower, which you can blow up and drop on Russian troops in Eastern Europe. But you can just move the front line there. Okay, all right. Um, we could do the cliche and have this all be in, in Western Europe because all that that's all that matters. Or we could put this in Eastern Europe and, you know, have the SAS guys and the Delta Force guys teaming up with Special forces from Poland, Ukraine, these various other Eastern European countries, which whose names are completely escaping me at this time, and have them work together. And you know what? Who knows? Maybe people in Eastern Europe might pirate our game less if we have them, if we have people from their countries playing a role as part of the good guys in a game like this, in, in, in a Western-made AAA title like this, for perhaps the first time in the history of gaming. I mean, if I mean, they these, these units exist, you could give them their shot in the sun. It's probably not that hard. I bet you actors with a pol I bet hiring you know Polish actors who also speak English might be kind of affordable, maybe even more affordable than hiring big name talent. I'm just saying. But no, we have to have a sequence where we blow up the Eiffel fucking tower. Because we need to have something that is insane. And I don't just mean set in Paris. At this point, the game's narrative actually manages to get slightly back on the rails. U.S. Special Forces troops, specifically the Delta Forces guys from earlier in the game, attempt to find and secure the Russian president's daughter, who is the only person who Makarov can use as a bargaining chip against the president in order to get the launch codes. Meanwhile... Price, Soap, and Yuri hunt down Makarov in order to get him and hopefully also find the Russian president. In the process, Makarov discovers them and kills Soap and also reveals that he knows Yuri. When Price finds out about this, he takes it rather well. Trust 
trusted you. I thought I could too. So why in bloody hell does Makarov know you? We learned that Yuri basically was part of the events of the story all the way from the very beginning, just in the background. He was part of Zakayev's organization at the bit in Chernobyl at the start, not the start, but the flashback of the first game. He was there when the nuclear weapon was detonated, also in the first game, and he left Makarov's organization right before the airport attack in the second game. At which point, well, Price decided to trust Yuri, and the two plot threads, the Delta Force plot and the Price pro plot, finally recombine with the combined forces assaulting a basically a mine that is being used by Makarov to hold both the daughter and the Russian president. Both of them are rescued, although in the process the Delta Force team is wiped out. Finally, the story comes to its conclusion with Yuri and Price, with you for the first time controlling Captain Price, assaulting a hotel in the Arabian Peninsula, I'm going to assume Dubai, and attacking it and finally getting your bloody revenge on Makarov, stopping him and his ambitions once and for all. Straight up, this game's narrative is bad. The vibe of the story is this. West from Zempel West and Zempella, Jason West and Vince Zempella, the heads of Infinity Ward who were fired after the release of Modern Warfare 2, I left the narrative of a situation where the next game was going to have a war with Russia in Europe. As part of a counteroffensive, not as a, another defensive war. However, after the departure of much of Infinity War's brain trust from the company, after West and Zampella were fired, or because either voluntarily or because they were fired themselves, the new writers of Modern Warfare 3 wanted something similar to the original idea, but different. And they wanted to also play up the spectacle. And they decided that they also wanted the, that they also had to wrap up the US invasion plot in this game, because I guess they thought the way it was wrapped up at the conclusion of Modern Warfare 2 wasn't enough. And this led to two narratives that just didn't play well together due to the timetable. That said, some of this might be simple to fix. I mean, you can still do your New York levels, set that contemporaneously with the events in Modern Warfare 2. And involve, um, maybe a little later, and then just up the timetable between the war in Europe and then, and the, uh, invasion of the United States by, you know, up until like a year or more. Possibly even have, um, as part of the plot, have Makarov fake the death of the Russian um, president. In fact, actually, you can even have him frame SAS for this. Uh, there's this bit of dialogue in there when uh, Makarov's suppliers are being tracked down and the um, and uh, Price contacts the head of the SAS, who was uh, Price's superior officer back at the Siberia mission in the first game. And we have a dialogue here, a little throwaway bit, with the head of the SAS telling Price to keep to look out for himself. They we had a bunch of SAS officers go missing. We're not sure what happened to them. And then have it set up when Makarov attacks the plane. Have to be a little later in the game. Um, but still kind of in the first act. Where have it, Makarov deposit the bodies of a bunch of, of these dead SAS officers at the side of the attack on the plane to frame Britain for the attack. Yeah, he's reusing a plan from part two. But if we're using it in a better fashion, it still has those unfortunate overtones, but it still works a little better. I think. Um, having, a fake, having a fake assassination attempt as opposed to, you know, 
um, what we have here, where it's basically nothing to attempt to justify this new war. But yeah, as far as the game story is concerned, it is utter crap, with a few interesting moments here and there, but crap nonetheless. nonetheless. Next week, however, do something a little different. I'm going to review a little with a better Russian invasion of Western Europe. I am going to review Tom Clancy's maybe his best work, Red Storm Rising. Red Storm Rising. Until next time, I'm Count Zero. Thanks for watching.